Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, on the 8th of November, the Holy Church commemorates the Synexes of the Archangels Michael and Gabriel and the rest of the bodiless and heavenly ranks, the seraphim, cherubim, thrones, dominions, authorities, powers, principalities, archangels, and angels. Concerning angels, St. John of Damascus writes, God is himself the maker and creator of the angels, for he brought them out of nothing into being and created them after his own image. They are an incorporeal race, a sort of spirit or immaterial fire, even as the divine David says that his angels are spirits and his liturgists a flame of fire. By this, he has described their lightness and the ardor, heat, keenness, and sharpness with which they hunger for God and serve him. He also has disclosed how they are born to the regions above and are quite delivered from all material thought. An angel, then, is an intelligent essence in perpetual motion with free will, incorporeal ministering to God, having obtained by grace an immortal nature. The Creator alone knows the form and limitation of the angelic essence, but all that we can understand is that it is incorporeal and immaterial, for all that is compared with God, who alone is incomparable, we find to, the, to be dense and material. For in reality, only the deity is immaterial and incorporeal. The angel's nature, then, is rational and intelligent and endowed with three will, changeable in will or fickle. For all that is created is changeable, and only that which is uncreated is unchangeable. Also, all that is rational is endowed with free will, as the angel is. Then, rational and intelligent, this being is endowed with free will, and as this being is created, it is changeable, having power either to abide or progress in goodness, or to turn toward evil. They are not susceptible of repentance because they are incorporeal, for it is owing to the weakness of his body that man comes to have repentance. They are immortal, not by nature, but by grace, for all that has had a beginning comes also to its natural end. But God alone is eternal, or rather, he is above the eternal, for he is the creator of times, for he, the creator of times, is not under the dominion of time, but above time. There are secondary intelligent lights derived from that first light which is without beginning, for they have the power of illumination. They have no need of tongue or hearing, but without uttering words, they communicate to each other their thoughts and counsels. Through the Logos, therefore, all the angels were created, and through the sanctification of the Holy Spirit were they brought to perfection, sharing each in proportion to his worth and rank in brightness and grace. They are circumscribed, for when they are in the heavens, they are not on the earth. When they are sent by God down to the earth, they do not remain in the heavens. They are not hemmed in by walls and doors and bars and seals, and they are quite unlimited. Unlimited, I repeat, for it is not as they really are that they reveal themselves to the worthy men to whom God wishes them to appear, but in a changed form which the beholders are capable of seeing. For that alone is naturally and strictly unlimited, which is uncreated, for every created thing is limited by God who created it. Further, apart from their essence, they receive the sanctifications from the Spirit. Through divine grace, they prophesy, they have no need of marriage, for they are immortal. Seeing that they are minds, they are in mental places, and are not circumscribed after the fashion of a body, for they have not a bodily form by nature. Nor are they extended in three dimensions, but to whatever post they may be assigned, there they are present 
after the manner of a mind, and they energize, but they cannot be present and energize in various places at the same time. Whether they are equals in essence or differ from one another, we know not. God, their creator, who knows all things, alone knows, but they differ from each other in brightness and position. Whether it is that their position is dependent on their brightness or their brightness on their position, they also impart brightness to one another because they excel one another in rank and nature. Clearly, the higher share their brightness and knowledge with the lower. They are mighty and prompt to fulfill the will of the deity, and their nature is endowed with such celerity that wherever the divine glance bids them, there they are straightway found. They are the guardians of the divisions of the earth. They are set over nations and regions allotted to them by their creator, they govern all our affairs and bring us secure. The reason surely is because they are set over us by the divine will and command and are ever in the vicinity of God. With difficulty they are moved to evil, yet they are not absolutely immovable. But now they are altogether immovable, not by nature, but by grace and by their nearness to the only God. They behold God according to their capacity, and this is their food. They are above us, for they are incorporeal, and are free of all bodily passion, yet are not passionless, for the deity alone is passionless. They take different forms at the bidding of their master God, and thus reveal themselves to men, and unveil the divine mysteries to them. They have heaven for their dwelling place, and have one duty, to sing God's praises and carry out his divine will. Moreover, as that most holy and sacred and gifted theologian, Dionysius the Areopagite, says, All theology, that is to say, the Holy Scripture, has mine different names for the heavenly essences. These essences that divine master in sacred things divides into three groups, each containing three. And the first group, he says, consists of those who are in God's presence and are said to be directly and immediately one with him, namely the seraphim with their six wings, the many-eyed cherubim, and those that sit in the holiest thrones. The second group is that of the, the dominions and the powers and the authorities. And the third and last is that of the principalities and archangels and angels. Some indeed, like Gregory the theologian, say that these were before the creation of other things. He thinks that the angelic and heavenly powers were first and that thought and that thought was their function. Others again hold that they were created after the first heaven was made, but all are agreed that it was before the foundation of man. For myself I am in harmony with a the theologian who was fitting that the mental essence should be the first created, and then that which can be perceived, and finally man himself, in whom being both parts are united. But those who say that the angels are creators of any kind, of essence, whatever, are the mouth of their father, the devil. For since they are created, they are not creators. But he who creates, and provides for, and maintains all things is God, who alone is uncreate, and is praised and glorified in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Celestial Hierarchies Adam and Eve were cast out from paradise. God expelled Adam and settled him over against the paradise of the delight, and he ordered the cherubim and the flaming sword, the one turning around, to guard the way of the tree of life. In the Psalter, too, there are references to angels, as well as in the prophetical writings and the book of Job. When the stars were made, all my angels praised me with a loud voice. The prophet Asias writes, I saw the Lord sitting on the high and exalted throne, and the house was full of his glory, and seraphs stood round about him. Each one had six wings, and with two they covered their face, and with two they covered their feet 
and with two they flew, and one cried to the other, and they said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the lintel shook at the voice they uttered, and the house was filled with smoke. And the, again, I'll say that. And the lintel shook at the voice they uttered, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am pricked to the heart, for being a man and having unclean lips, I dwell in the midst of a people having unclean lips, and I have seen with my eyes the King, the Lord of hosts. And there was sent to me one of the seraphs, and he had in his hand a coal, which he had taken from the altar with the tongs. And he vouchsafed my mouth and said, he touched, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this hath touched thy lips and will take away thine iniquities and will purge off thy sins. The prophet Ezekiel beheld the cherubim in his vision of the temple and wrote, I looked and behold, over the, fir over the firmament that was above the head of the cherubs, there was a likeness of a throne over them as a sapphire stone. And he said to the man clothed with a long robe, Go in between the wheels that are under the cherubs, and fill thy hands with coals of fire from between the cherubs, and scatter them over the city. And he went in my sight, and the cherubs stood on the right hand of the house as the man went in, and the cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord departed from the cherubs to the porch of the house, and the cloud filled the house, and the court was filled with the brightness of the glory of the Lord. And the sound of the cherubs' wings was heard as far as the outer court, as the voice of the Almighty God speaking. And I saw the cherubs having the likeness of men's hands under their wings, and I saw, and behold, four wheels stood by the cherubs, one wheel by each cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was as the appearance of a carbuncle stone. And as for their appearance, there was one likeness to the four, as if there should be a wheel in the midst of a wheel. When they went, they went on their four sides. They turned not when they went, for whichever way the first head looked, they went. And they turned not as they went, as their backs and their hands and their wings And the wheels were full of eyes, round about the four wheels, and these wheels were called Gedil in my hearing. Then the glory of the Lord departed from the house and went up on the cherubs. And the cherubs lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. When they went forth, the wheels were also beside them. And they stood at the entrance of the front gate of the house of the Lord, and the glory of God of Israel was upon them above. This is the living creature which I saw under the God of Israel by the river of Chobar, and I knew that they were cherubs. Each one had four faces, and each one had eight wings, and under their wings was the likeness of men's ha hands. And as for the likeness of their faces, these are the same faces which I saw under the glory of the God of Israel by the river of Chobar, and they went each straight forward. We read in the epistle of St. Peter of Jesus, who went into the heavens, heaven and is at the right of God, and angels and authorities and powers have been made subject to him. In the epistle of St. Paul, that in Christ were all things created, the things in the heavens and the things upon the earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities. All things through him and to him have been created, and he is before all things, and in him all things have come into existence. St. Dionysius, the Areopagite, writes that these holy powers possess an unshakable courage in all its godlike energies, which abandons all laziness and softness during the reception of the divine illuminations granted to it, and is powerfully uplifted to an assimilation with God. It looks undeviatingly 
to that transcendent power which is the source of all power. This courage indeed becomes, so far as possible, the very image of that power to which it shapes itself, being powerfully returned to it because it is the source of all power. At the same time, it transmits to its own inferiors its dynamic and divinizing power. St. Dionysius, the Areopagite, again answers, How many ranks are there among the heavenly beings? What kind are they? The Word of God has provided nine explanatory designations for the heavenly beings, and mine own sacred initiator, St. Hierotheos, has divided these into three threefold groups. According to him, the first group is forever around God and is said to be permanently united with him ahead of any of the others and with no intermediary. Here, then, are the most holy thrones in the orders said to possess many eyes and many wings, called in the Hebrew the cherubim and seraphim. The second group, he says, is made up of authorities and dominions and powers. The third, at the end of the heavenly hierarchies, is the group of angels and archangels and principalities. The title of the most sublime and exalted thrones is convey, conveys that in them there is a transcendence over every earthly defect, as shown by their upward bearing, toward the ultimate heights, that they are forever separated from what is inferior, and that they are completely intent upon remaining always in the presence of him who is truly the Most High, that, free of all passion and material concern, they are utterly available to receive the divine visitation, that they bear God and are ever open like servants to welcome God. The revealing name Dominions signifies, in my view, a lifting up which is free, unfettered by earthly tendencies, and not inclined toward any of those tyrannical dissimilarities which characterize a harsh dominion. It rejects empty appearances, returns completely to the true Lord, and shares as far as it can in that everlasting and divine source of all dominion. The term heavenly principalities, refers to those who possess a godlike and princely hegemony with a sacred order most suited to princely powers. They have the ability to be returned completely toward that principle which is above all principles, and to lead others to him like a prince, and the power to receive to the full the mark of the principle of principalities, and by their harmonious exercise of princely powers to make manifest this transcendent principle of all order. The holy authorities, as their name indicates, have an equal order with the divine dominions and powers. They are so placed that they can receive God in a harmonious and unconfused way and indicate the ordered nature of the celestial and intellectual authority. They do know Tyrannous, tyrannous harm to the inferiors. They are harmonious and unfailingly uplifted toward the things of God, and in their goodness they lift up with them the ranks of those inferior to them. St. Paul writes that the most variegated wisdom of God is made known to the principalities and to the authorities in the heavenlies through the church, according to the purpose of the ages, which he made in Christ Jesus our Lord. St. John Chrysostom writes, As though speaking to the Apostle Paul, To mankind it was not revealed, and art thou enlightening angels and archangels and principalities and authorities? Yes, says he, for it was hid in God, even in God who created all things. And dost thou venture to say this? Yes, says he, but whence has this become manifest to the angels? Through the church. Again, he says, not simply the manifold, 
but the much variegated wisdom of God, that is the multiplied and varied, what then is this? Did not angels know it? Not at all. For if principalities knew it not, much less could angels have ever known it. What then? Did not even archangels know it? But who was to reveal it? When we were taught it, then were they also through us. For hearken to the words of the angel to Joseph. The names of the archangels. In the sacred scriptures, we find the names of some of the archangels. Archangel Michael, whose name signifies who is like unto God, may be found in Daniel, Jude, and Revelations. Archangel Gabriel, whose name signifies man of God, may be found in Daniel and Luke. In the deuterocanonical books, the archangel Raphael, whose name signifies God heals, may be found in Tobit. Archangel Uriel, whose name signifies the fire of God, or Archangel Jeremiel, whose name signifies the highness of mercy of God, may be found in 2 Esdras. Archangel Uriel is also listed in 2 Esdras. Archangel Salathiel, whose name signifies prayer to God, or Archangel Faltiel, or Saltiel, may be found in 2 Esdras. Apart from these names, although pious tradition lists two other names of archangels, they are not listed in Holy Scripture. Jehudiel, whose name signifies the praise of God, and Barakiel, whose name signifies the blessing of God. The roster of the archangels showing these alternative names abounds. It is generally agreed, however, that there are seven. Concerning the Fallen Angels The devil, also known as Satan or the enemy, was created as a mighty and beautiful archangel, one of the most perfect and radiant. He was given the name Lucifer, meaning light bearer. John, St. John of Damascus writes, Lucifer was not made wicked in nature, but was good and made for good ends and received from his creator no trace whatever of evil in himself. But he did not sustain the brightness and the honor which the creator had bestowed on him of his free choice. He was changed from what was in harmony to what was at variance with his nature, and he became roused against God who created him. He was determined to rise in rebellion against God. Thus he was the first to depart from good and become evil. For evil is nothing else than the absence of goodness, just as darkness also is absence of light. For goodness is the light of the mind, and similarly, evil is the darkness of the mind. Now, along with him, an innumerable host of angels subjected, subject to him were torn away, followed him, and shared in his fall. Therefore, being of the same nature as the angels, they became wicked, turning away at their own free choice from good to evil. Hence, Lucifer boasted with pride that he would set his throne on the clouds of heaven and become equal to the Almighty, even as Isaias writes, How hath Lucifer, who rose in the morning, fallen from heaven? He that sent orders to all the nations is crushed to the earth. But thou saidest in thy heart, I will go up to heaven, I will set my throne above the stars of heaven, and will sit on a lofty mount, on the lofty mountains toward the north. I will go up above the clouds, I will be like the Most High. But now thou shalt go down to Hades, even in the found, to the foundations of the earth. After he dared these things, he fell from his glory, even as our Lord speaks in the gospel, saying, I was beholding Satan as lightning, having fallen out of the heaven. Likewise, the order of angels that were subject to him rebelled against God out of pride 
and they fell along with its leader, Lucifer, and they all assumed a black and dismal appearance instead of their radiance and became demons instead of angels. In the Apocalypse we read, And there came to be a war in heaven, Michael and his angels, so that he fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels, and he prevailed not, nor was his place found any longer in the heaven. And the dragon was cast out, the serpent, the great one, the ancient one, the one being called devil and Satan, the one leading astray the whole inhabited world, was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The chief of the apostles, Peter, writes that the final judgment is still due the apostate angels. God spared not angels who sinned, but cast them into Tartarus and delivered them to judgment with cores of darkness which have been kept for them. The Apostle Jude also speaks of this writing. Those angels who kept not their first place but deserted their own habitation he hath kept in everlasting bonds under darkness until the judgment of the great day. St. Dionysius, the Areopagite, comments, If they are called evil, it is not in respect of their being, since they owe their origin to the good and were the recipients of a good being, but rather because being is lacking lacking to them by virtue of their inability, as scripture puts it, to keep their first place. For I ask you, in what way are the demons evil, except in the fact that they have put an end to the habit and act the activity of divine good things? Their evil consists in the lack of the angelic virtues. If they are declared evil, the reason lies in their weakness regarding their natural activity. Their deviation is the devil in them. Their move away from what benefits them, what has happened to them, is that they have fallen away from the complete goodness granted to them. They are called evil because of the deprivation, the abandonment, the rejection of the virtues which are appropriate to them. Then accordingly, the great archangel Michael, seeing the downfall of the angels, knew the reason for their ouster. With the obedience and loyalty of a dutiful servant to his master and God, he safeguarded his own glory and honor that were bestowed by God, as well as the glory of the other angelic powers. Thereby, for his loyalty and gratitude, he was appointed by the Almighty, chief among the angelic powers. Because he summoned together and united the angelic powers as he proclaimed to them, let us attend, let us stand well, let us stand with fear. That is, let us perceive the fate of the fallen demons due to, to their arrogance, who not long ago were as us, and let us perceive what is God and what is an angel. For the former is the creator and lord of the angels, and we are servants and creatures of his. Thus he praised and exalted the king of the universe as he chanted, with all the angels, the divine hymn, Holy, 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 Lord of the Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. We have been handed down this mystery from an ancient tradition and celebrate this day, calling it the Synaxis of the angels, or oneness of mind and or unity of purpose. After saying all this, St. John Damascus writes that, the devil and the demons have no power or strength against anyone except what God in his dispensation has conceded to them. As, for instance, against Job and those swine that are mentioned in the Gospels. But when God has made the concession, they do prevail and are changed and transformed into any form whatever in which they wish to appear. Of the future, both the angels of God and the demons are alike ignorant, yet they pronounce predictions. God reveals the future to the angels and commands them to prophecy, and so what they say comes to pass. But the demons also make predictions, sometimes because they see what is happening at a distance, 
and sometimes merely making guesses. Hence, much that the demons say is false, and they should not be believed, even though they do often, in the way we have said, tell what is true, besides they know the scriptures. All wickedness, then, and all impure passions are the work of their mind. But while the liberty to attack man has been granted to them, they have not the strength to overmaster anyone. For we have it in our power to receive or not to receive the attack. Thus, there has been prepared for the devil and his demons and those who follow him fire unquenchable and everlasting punishment. Furthermore, note that what in the case of man is death is a fall in the case of angels. For after the fall, there is no possibility of repentance for them, just as after death, there is for men no repentance. Appearances in the Old Testament Michael, the most glorious and radiant chief commander of the bodiless powers, and the other archangels and angels have performed numerous benevolent deeds and rendered great assistance to the race of man, as we shall see demonstrated in both the Old Testament and in the new period of the grace of the gospel. In some instances, however, we shall see that the angel of the Lord is the Logos himself. 1. The Preservation of Hagar and Ishmael when Hagar learned that she was with Abram's child and was afflicted by Sarah, she fled into the wilderness. An angel of the Lord found her by the fountain of waters in the wilderness in the way of Shur. The angel of the Lord said to her, Hagar, whence comest thou and whither goest thou? She said, I am fleeing from the face of my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hands. The angel of the Lord said to her, I will surely multiply thy seed, and it shall not be numbered for multitude. Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, for the Lord hath hearkened to thy humiliation. He shall be a wild man, his hands against all, in the hands of all against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all the bre his brethren. The Lord then visited Sarah, and she conceived by Abraham, and gave birth to Isaac. Sarah saw Ishmael sporting with Isaac, and asked Abraham to have the bondswoman, Hagar, and her son cast out. After this had been done, Hagar and her son wandered in the wilderness near the well of the oath, they had no water. God heard the voice of Ishmael crying and weeping, and an angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What is it, Hagar? Fear not. Rise up and take the child and hold him in thy hand, for I will make him a great nation. God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of springing water, and she went and filled the skin with water and gave the child drink. 2. The Angel of God in Scriptures St. Hilary of Poitiers, speaking of the Trinity and the book of Genesis, makes a clear distinction between the angels and the angel of God, who is the Logos. In this account, with Hagar and Abraham concerning future things, there are considerations which must be taken into account in complete treatment of the subject which must be reserved for discussion in a separate book, for there are a number of instances in the scriptures where an angel is described, but it is the Lord himself. St. Hilary writes, It is the angel of God who speaks to Hagar and speaks of things far beyond the powers which a messenger could possess. He says that, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, and it shall not be numbered for multitude. The power of multiplying nations lies outside the ministry of an angel. Yet w what says the scripture of him who is called the angel of God, yet speaks words which are be belong to God alone? And she called the name of the Lord that spake with her, 
Thou art God who hast seen me. First, he is the angel of God. Then he is the Lord, for she called the name of the Lord. Then, thirdly, he is God. For thou art God who hast seen me. He who is called the angel of God is also Lord and God. The Son of God is also, according to the prophet, the angel of great counsel. To discriminate clearly between the persons, he is called the angel of God. He who is God from God is also the angel of God. But that he may have the honor which is his due, he is entitled also Lord and God. Again, it is God who speaks to Abraham concerning Ishmael. Thus God and the angel of God are one. He who is the angel of God is also God, the Son of God. He is called the angel because he is the angel of great counsel, but afterward he is spoken of as God, lest we should suppose that he who is God is only an angel. In another instance, the scripture reveals through Abraham that it was God who spoke. He receives the further promise of a son, Isaac. Afterward, there appeared to him three men at the oak of Mambre. Abraham, though he sees three, worships one and acknowledge him as Lord. Three were standing before him, scripture says, but he knew well whom it was that he must worship and confess. There was nothing in outward appearance to distinguish them, but by the eye of faith, the vision of the soul, he knew his Lord. It was a man that was seen, yet Abraham worshipped him as Lord. He beheld, no doubt, in a mystery, the coming incarnation. Faith so strong has not missed its recognition. The Lord says in the Gospel, your father, Abraham, rejoiced exceedingly that he should see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Thus, by all his words, Abraham instructs us in that faith, for which he was justified. He recognizes the Lord from among the three. He worships him only and confesses that he is the Lord and judge. Moreover, the man who spoke with Abraham was also God and Lord, which the two angels who were seen with the Lord and whom he sent to Lot are described by the prophet as angels and nothing more. Nor was it to Abraham only that God appeared in human guise. He appeared as man to Jacob also, as not only did he appear, but so we are told he wrestled and not only did he wrestle, but also he was vanquished by his adversary. Neither the time at my disposal nor the subject will allow me to discuss the typical meaning of this wrestling. It was certainly God who wrestled, for Jacob prevailed against God, and Israel saw God. 3. Righteous Lot is saved from Sodom. Two angels came to Sodom at evening. Lot sat by the gate of Sodom, and rose up to meet them, and offer them hospitality. Nay, but we will lodge in the street, they said. Lot constrained them. After they ate, the Sodomites compassed Lot's house, and called out Lot, and said to him, Where are the men that went in to thee this night? Bring them out to us, that we may be with them. He said, By no means, brethren. Do not act villainously, but I have two daughters who have not known a man. I will bring them out to you, and do ye use them as it may please you. Only do, not in, do no injury to these men, to avoid which they came under the shelter of my roof. The Sodomites then drew nigh to break the door. The angels stretched forth their hands and drew Lot in to them into the house, and shut the door of the house. Then the angels smote the men that were out the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, and they were wearied with seeking the door. Then the angels urged Lot to depart with those with them. 
for we are going to destroy this place. For their cry hath been raised up before the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. Lot went out with his wife and two daughters. The Lord reigned on Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire, overthrowing Sodom and Gomorrah, and all the country round about. 4. The Deliverance of Isaac When Abraham was put to the test and told to take his beloved Isaac, and offer him for a whole burnt offering, he rose up and took the lad. Abraham took the wood of the whole burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took into his hands both the fire and the knife, and the two went together. Isaac asked, Father, where is the sheep for a whole burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide himself a sheep for a whole burnt offering, my son. Abraham then built the altar and laid the wood on it. He bound his son's feet and laid him on the altar. He then stretched forth his hand to take the knife to slay his son. When an angel of the Lord called him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Behold, I am here. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the child, neither do anything to him. For now I know that thou fearest God. And for my sake thou hast not spared thy beloved son. Abraham then lifted up his eyes and saw a ram caught by his horns. He took the ram and offered him up for a whole burnt offering in the place of Isaac his son. The angel of the Lord called Abraham the second time out of heaven, saying, I have sworn by myself, says the Lord, because thou hast done this thing and on my account hast not spared thy beloved son. Surely, blessing, I will bless thee. And multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is by the shore of the sea. And thy seed shall inherit the cities of their enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast hearkened to my voice. 5. More on Genesis other sightings of angels in Genesis include that of the prophet Jacob, who dreamed and beheld the ladder fixed on the earth, whose top reached to heaven, and the angels of God ascended and descended on it. Again, when Jacob departed Lebon and returned home to Yeshua, he looked up and saw the host of God encamped, and the angels of God met him. 6. The Appearance to the Soothsayer Balaam The archangel appeared to the soothsayer Balaam as the latter was on his way to curse the nation of Israel, menacing and presenting, preventing him from such an act. God was very angry because Balaam saddled his ass and went to the princes of Moab. Thus, the angel of the Lord rose up to withstand him. When the ass saw the angel of God standing opposite in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, then the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field. Balaam smote the ass with his staff to direct her in the way, but the angel of the Lord stood in the avenues of the vines, a fence being on this side and a fence on that. When the ass saw the angel of God, she thrust herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he smote her again. The angel of the Lord went further and came and stood in the narrow place where it was impossible to turn to the right or the left. When the ass saw the angel of God, she lay down under Balaam, and Balaam was angry and struck the ass with his staff. God then opened the mouth of the ass, and she spoke to Balaam, What have I done to thee, that thou hast smitten me this third time? Balaam said to the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, and if I had had a sword in my hand, I would not have killed thee. The ass said to Balaam, Am not I thine ass, on which thou hast ridden since thy youth till this day? Did I ever do thus to thee, utterly disregarding thee? No, said he. God then opened the eyes of Balaam. He beheld the angel of the Lord, 
withstanding him in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and he stooped down and made obeisance. The angel of God said to him, Why hast thou smitten thine ass this third time? And behold, I came out to withstand thee, for thy way was not seemly before me. And when the ass saw me, she turned away from me this third time. And if she had not turned out of the way, surely now I would have slain thee and should have saved her alive. And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know that thou wert standing opposite in the way to meet me. And now, if it shall not be pleasing to thee for me to go on, I will return. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men. Nevertheless, the word which I shall speak to thee, that thou shalt take heed to speak. 7. The Appearance During the Repose of Moses The servant of the Lord died in the land of Moab by the word of the Lord. They buried him in Gai, near the house of Fogor, and no one hath seen his sepulchre to this day. The apostle and brother of the Lord, Jude, writes, Now Michael, the archangel, when he took issue with the devil and was disputing about the body of Moses, did not dare to lay upon him a judgment of blasphemy, but said, May the Lord rebuke thee. St. Bede comments that it is not entirely obvious from what scriptures Jude took this witness. But nonetheless, we should know that we find something like it in the prophet Zacharias. We remain uncertain when Michael had a struggle with the devil, devil over the body of Moses. 8. The Appearance to Righteous Jesus, Joshua of Navi The archangel Michael stood before him with a drawn sword in his hand, and Jesus drew near and said, Art thou for us or on the side of our enemies? He answered, I am now come, the chief commander of the host of the Lord. Jesus fell on his face upon the earth and said to him, Master, what commandest thou thy servant? The commander answered, Loose thy shoe off thy feet, for the place whereon thou now standest is holy. 9. The Appearance of Gideon The children of Israel had done evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Madium. Israel was greatly impoverished because of Madian until righteous Gideon was called by God. Now in those days the angel of the Lord came and sat down under a fir tree, which was in Ephrathah. Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press in order to escape from the face of Madian. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with thee. Thou mighty in strength. And Gideon said to him, Be gracious with me, my Lord. But if the Lord is with us, why have these evils found us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers have related to us? Now he hath cast us out and given us into the hand of Madium. The angel of the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this thy strength and thou shalt save Israel out of the hand of Madium. Behold, I have sent thee. Gideon said to him, Be gracious with me, my Lord, whereby shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. The angel of the Lord said to him, The Lord shall be with thee, and thou shalt smite Madium as one man. Gideon then wished to make an offering, and the angel waited until he returned. The angel of the Lord stretched out the end of the rod that was in his hand, and touched the flesh and the unleavened bread, and fire came up out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened bread, and the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. 
Gideon saw that he was the angel of the Lord, and Gideon said, Ah, ah, Lord my God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said to him, Peace be to thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. And Gideon built there an altar to the Lord, and called it the peace of the Lord. 10. The Appearance to Manoah and His Wife An appearance was made to the barren wife of Manoah in the time of the judges to make known to her the birth of Samson, saying, Behold, thou art barren and bearest not, yet thou shalt conceive a son. The woman then went and told her husband, saying, Ah, a man of God came to me, and his appearance was as of an angel of God, very dreadful. And I did not ask him whence he was, and he did not tell me his name. Manoah wished to detain him and feed him. The angel of the Lord said to him, If thou shouldest detain me, I will not eat of thy bread, and if thou wouldest offer a whole burnt offering, to the Lord thou shalt offer it. Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord, and he said, What is thy name, that when thy word shall come to pass, we may glorify thee? The angel of the Lord said to him, Why dost thou ask after my name, whereas it is wonderful? Manoah then made a meat offering and offered it on the rock to the Lord. And it came to pass, when the flame went up above the altar toward heaven, that the angel of the Lord went up in the flame. 11. The Slaughter of the Hebrews The devil stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. King David said to Joab and to the captains of the forces, Go! Number Israel from Bersabi even to Dan, and bring me the account, and I shall know their number. Joab said, May the Lord add to his people a hundredfold as many as they are, and let the eyes of my Lord the King see it. All are the servants of my Lord. Why does my Lord seek this thing? Do it not, lest it become a sin to Israel. Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab, who went out and gave the number of the mustering of the people to David. All Israel was a million and a hundred thousand men that could draw the sword. Joab, however, did not number them all, for the ward of the king was painful to Joab, and there was evil in the sight of the Lord respecting this thing. And he smote Israel. David said to God, I have sinned exceedingly, and that I have done this thing. And now I pray thee, remove the sin of thy servant, for I have been exceedingly foolish. The Lord spoke to God, the seer, saying, Go and speak to David, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I bring three things upon thee, choose one of them. For thyself, and I will do it to thee. God came to David and said to him, Thus saith the Lord, Choose for thyself either three years of famine, or that thou shouldest flee three months from the face of thine enemies, and the sword of thine enemies shall be employed to destroy thee, or that the sword of the Lord and pestilence should be three days in the land, and the angel of the Lord shall be destroying throughout all the inheritance of Israel. And now consider what I shall answer to him that sent the message. David said to God, They are very hard for me, even all the three. Let me fall now into the hands of the Lord, for his enemies are very abundant, and let me not fall by any means into the hands of man. So the Lord brought pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel seventy thousand men. And God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord saw and relented 
over the calamity and said to the angel that was destroying, Let it suffice thee, withhold thy hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Orna the Jebusite. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between the earth and the heaven, and his sword drawn in his hand, stretched out over Jerusalem. And David and the elders clothed in sackcloth fell upon their faces. And David said to God, Was it not I that gave orders to number the people? And I am the guilty one. I have greatly sinned. But these sheep, what have they done? O Lord God, let thy hand be upon me and upon my father's house, and not on thy people for destruction, O Lord. And the angel of the Lord told God to tell David that he should go up to erect an altar to the Lord in the threshing floor of Orna the Jebusite, which he purchased and offered sacrifice there. The Lord then spoke to the angel, and he put up the sword into its sheath. 12. The Appearances to the Prophet Elias In the days of Ahab, king of Israel, and his wife Jezebel, prophet Elias was being pursued by the queen for having put to death her idolatrous priests. The prophet fled into the wilderness and sat under a juniper tree and said, O Lord, take, I pray thee, my life from me, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept there under a tree, and behold, someone touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And Elias looked, and behold, at his head, there was a cake of meal and a cruse of water, and he arose and ate and drank, and he returned and lay down. And the angel of the Lord returned again and touched him and said to him, Arise and eat, for the journey is far from thee. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of the meat forty days and forty nights to Mount Cherub. After the death of Ahab, King Ocosius fell through the lattice that was in his upper chamber in Samaria and was sick. He sent messengers and said to them, Go and inquire of Baal, fly the god of Acheron, whether I shall recover of this my sickness. And they went to inquire of him, and an angel of the Lord called Elias, the Thesbite, saying, Arise and go to meet the messengers of Ocosias, uh, king of Samaria, and thou shalt say to them, Is it because there is no God in Israel that ye go to inquire of Baal Fly, the god of Acheron? But it shall not be so, for thus saith the Lord, the bed on which thou art gone up, thou shalt not come down from it, for thou shalt surely die. And Elias went and said to them, and the messengers returned to the king and reported to him what took place. The king ascertained that it was Elias, so he sent to him a captain of fifty and of fifty and his fifty. They went to Elias, who was on the top of a mountain. Fire came down and devoured them, and this happened again when another fifty were sent. The king sent yet again a captain and his fifty, and the third captain of fifty came and knelt on his knees before Elias and entreated him. The angel of the Lord spoke to Elias and said, Go down with him, be not afraid of them. And Elias rose up and went down with him to the king. 13. The Destruction of the Assyrians The Assyrian army invaded Judah, taking forty-six walled cities and spoiling the countryside. Sennacherib's field commander, 
Absiches, went to speak with King Ezekias, but was met by three of the king's officers at the upper pool. The field commander challenged Ezekias to have the refugees and Jews hear his speech by speaking in the Hebrew tongue. He warned them not to trust in Ezekias. He said the king of Assyria would deliver them and not God, and no one hath been delivered out of the hands of the Assyrians. He recklessly blasphemed God, whom he said he obeyed, when he commanded to go up against the land and destroy it. When the king was apprised of the meeting, he rent his clothes and put on sackcloth. He then went up to the temple and sent the steward and the scribe and the elders of the priests clothed with sackcloth to Esaias the prophet, who replied, Thus shall ye say to your master, Thus saith the Lord, be not thou afraid at the words which thou hast heard, wherewith the ambassadors of the king of the Assyrians have reproached me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a report, and return to his own country, and he shall fall by the sword in his own land. And indeed, Rapsikis returned to find his king besieging another place. The Assyrians received a report about the Ethiopian king who was coming to attack them, so they turned aside. The Assyrians, however, sent Ezekias a note, telling him not to find relief and trust that God delivered them. The pagan then reproached God, and Ezekias took himself away to the temple that he might pray for deliverance. Prophet Isaiah was then sent to him, and said, Thus saith the Lord concerning the king of the Assyrians, He shall not enter this into this city, nor cast a weapon against it, nor bring a shield against it, nor make a rampart round it. But by the way by which he came by it shall he return, and shall not enter into this city. I will protect this city to save it for my own sake, and for my servant, David's sake. An angel of the Lord then went forth and slew 185,000 out of the Assyrian camp. They were found the following morning. Sennacherib then returned to Nineveh. While there he was worshiping his country's God, and his sons rose up and slew him with swords in the house. 14. Prophet Daniel in the Lion's Den The prophet had been informed against that he was praying toward his Jerusalem and giving thanks to his God. On account of King Darius's irrevocable decree, they cast him into the den of lions. They brought a stone and put it on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his ring and with the ring of his nobles. God, however, shut the mouths of the lions, that they not molest Daniel. Then the king arose very early in the morning, and came in haste to the den of lions. When he drew near to the den, he cried with a loud voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, hath thy God, whom thou servest continually, been able to deliver thee from the lion's mouth? Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel and stopped the lion's mouths, and they have not hurt me, for uprightness was found in me before him. And moreover, before thee, O king, I have committed no trespass. Then the king was very glad for him, and he commanded to bring Daniel out of the den. So Daniel was brought out of the den, and there was found no hurt upon him, because he delivered in his, he believed in his God. 15. The prophet Abacoam is seized. There was in Jewry a prophet named Abacoam, who had made pottage, and had spoken, had broken bread in a bowl, and was going into the field so as to bring it to the reapers. 
But the angel of the Lord said unto, unto Abacoam, Go, carry the dinner that thou hast into Babylon unto Daniel, who is in the lion's den. Abacoam said, Lord, I never saw Babylon, neither do I know where the den is. The angel then took him by the crown and carried him by the hair of his head, and through the vehemency of his spirit set him in Babylon over the den. Abacoam cried, saying, Daniel, Daniel, take the dinner which God hath sent thee. Daniel said, Thou hast remembered me, O God, neither hast thou forsaken them that seek thee and love thee. Daniel then arose and ate, and the angel of the Lord set Abacoam in his own place again immediately. 16. Prophet Daniel receives prophecies from Archangel Gabriel. In the vision of Prophet Daniel, Gabriel's name appears literally as man of God when he interpreted the vision which Daniel saw concerning the kings of the Medes, the Persians, and the Greeks. The prophet writes, And it came to pass, as I, even I, Daniel, saw the vision, and sought to understand it, that, behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. At another time, Archangel Gabriel appeared to Daniel and made known to him that the Messiah, Christ, would come in the flesh. Yea, while I was yet speaking in prayer, behold, the man, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, came flying, and he touched me about the hour of the evening sacrifice. And he instructed me and spoke with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to impart to thee understanding. Thou shalt know and understand that from the going forth of the command for the answer and the building of Jerusalem until Christ the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. 17. Archangel Raphael and Tobit Tobit and his son Tobias were accompanied by the archangel Raphael. God hath sent me, speaks the archangel, to heal thee and Sarah thy daughter-in-law. I am Raphael, one of the seven holy angels, who present the prayers of the saints, and who go in and out before the glory of the Holy One. Angels in the New Testament In the New Testament, the archangel Gabriel announces the birth of St. John the Baptist to his father, the righteous priest Zacharias. This archangel also announced the incarnation of the Christ Jesus to the Holy Virgin Mary. He also appeared to the righteous Joseph in a dream and told him not to fear to take Mary his wife and that she shall bring forth a son whom he was to name Jesus. An angel also appeared to Joseph to take the child and his mother into Egypt. While Joseph was in Egypt, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, telling him to return to Israel. At the nativity of Christ, an angel of the Lord appeared to the shepherds, announcing the newborn babe. Then a multitude of the heavenly host were praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will among men. The Magi were warned in a dream not to return to Herod. Angels ministered to Jesus after the temptation in the mount. In Gethsemane, an angel from heaven appeared to Jesus, strengthening him. An angel rolled away the stone from Christ's tomb and announced the resurrection to the women. As the disciples looked on, a cloud took Jesus up from under at his ascension, and two men, or angels, stood by them in a white raiment, saying, raiment, saying Men, Gal Galileans, why do you stand looking into the heavens? This Jesus, the one who was taken up from you into the heaven, 
so shall he come in the manner ye beheld him going into the heaven. The apostles were arrested, but an angel of the Lord during the night opened the doors of the prison and led them out, telling them to take a stand in the temple and to be speaking to the people all the words of this life. An angel spoke to Philip that he might baptize the Ethiopian eunuch. Cornelius was visited by an angel. When, the, when Peter was seized and put in prison, an angel stood by him. The apostles' chains fell off, and the angel led him out to safety. An angel smote Herod, and he was eaten by worms and expired. Before Paul was shipwrecked, an angel of the Lord stood by him. The book of Revelation is filled with accounts of the angels. The book opens declaring a revelation of Jesus Christ, having been sent forth by his angel. Then we are told that the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. The seven angels of the seven churches of Asia are discussed from Revelations. In Revelations, we read of a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals of it? In Revelations, St. John says, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. He then saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. St. John also writes about seven angels and seven trumpets and an angel of the incense. I saw the seven angels, the ones who stand before God, and there were given to them seven trumpets. And another angel came and took his stand at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given to him much incense in order that he should give it with the prayers of all the saints upon the altar, the golden one, which is before the throne. The evangelist then speaks, the evangelist then speaks of the seven angels of the seven thunders. The seven thunders spoke their own sounds, and when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, and I heard a voice out of the heaven saying, Seal up the things which the seven thunders spoke, and do not begin to write them. There is an angel with them who is described by the evangelist as standing on the sea and on the land, with his right hand lifted up, who swore by the one living to the ages of the ages. He was clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was on his head, and his face was as the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire, and he had in his hand a book having been opened. And he cried with a loud voice, even as a lion roareth. St. John then speaks of the angel with a little book who commanded the evangelist to eat it. I took the book out of the hand of the angel and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And when I ate it, my belly was made bitter. And they say, and they say to me, It is needful for thee again to prophesy because of many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. In chapter 14 of Revelation, the evangelist declares, I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having the everlasting gospel to announce the good tidings to those sitting on the earth, saying in a loud voice, Fear the Lord and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and make obeisance to the one having made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of the waters. And another, a second angel, followed, saying, it is fallen, it is fallen, Babylon the great, which hath made all nations to drink out of the wine of the anger of her fornication. And another, a third angel, followed them, saying in a loud voice, 
If any one maketh obeyance to the beast and his image, and receiveth his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also shall drink out of the wine of the anger of God, which hath been mixed undiluted in the cup of his wrath, and he shall be tormented in fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goeth up to the ages of ages, and they have no rest day and night. The one making obeyance to the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Another angel was then seen coming out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to the one sitting on the cloud, Send thy sickle and reap, for the hour is come to reap, for the harvest of the earth is become dry. And another angel came out of the altar, having authority over the fire, and he gave utterance with a great cry to the one having the sickle, the sharp one, saying, Send thy sickle, the sharp one, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for the grape of the earth did ripen. And the angel threw his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and threw it into the wine vat, the great one, of the anger of God. The evangelist then saw seven angels having seven plagues. St. John then heard the angel of the water saying, Righteous art thou, because thou didst judge these things. For they poured out the blood of saints and prophets, and blood hast thou given to them to drink. They are deserving. The evangelist then saw another angel coming down out of the heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated by reason of his glory. And he cried with a strong voice, saying, It is fallen Babylon the great, and it is become a habitation of demons. And the kings of the earth committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth became rich by the power of her wantonness. St. John then writes of seeing an angel coming down out of the heaven, having the key of the abyss and a great chain upon his hand. Thus, from the above, we see the angels executing God's holy will and being set in charge of physical elements. The Angels and the Second Coming the angels shall be ministers of Christ at the resurrection of the dead. Their participation and ministration are strongly attested by the New Testament. In the Gospel according to St. Matthew, Jesus announces that they shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send forth his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost parts of the heavens, unto their extremities. St. Paul writes, We say this to you by the word of the Lord, that we the living, the ones remaining over until the coming of the Lord, in no wise shall precede those who fell asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout of command, with a voice of an archangel, and with a trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we the living, the ones remaining over, shall be carried off together with them in, a cloud, in the clouds to a meeting of the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord." The reapers who separate the wheat from the darnel are angels sent by the Son of Man. Therefore, even as the darnel is gathered together and burned completely, thus it shall be in the consummation of this age. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather together out of his kingdom all the stumbling blocks and those doing lawlessness, and they shall cast them into the furnace of the fire. 
there shall be there the weeping and the gnashing of the teeth. Then the righteous shall shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. The one who hath ears to hear, let him hear. The angels shall also be present at the final or last judgment, even as it is written, Whenever the Son of Man should come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all the nations, and he shall separate them from one another, even as the shepherd separateth the sheep from the young kids, and, and indeed he shall set the sheep on his right, but the young kids on the left. Then shall the king say to those on his right, Come ye who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom which hath been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Thus the angels shall be present and participate in the eschatological events. They shall minister at the resurrection of the dead, the gathering of the elect, and the separation of the righteous from the wicked. Miracles of the Chief Commander of the Bodiless Host, the Archangel Michael, in Byzantine times. In the period after the New Testament, there are also accounts of the Archangel Michael's cures and wonders. Therefore, on this day, we call upon him as the protector of our lives and celebrate his honored feast with the remembrance of some of his marvels. The Church of the Archangel Michael in Sostenion. When Emperor Constantine the Great, 306 337, was building up Byzant Byzantium, later known as Constantinople, it came to pass that he constructed a church dedicated to the Archangel Michael in the surrounding suburb, known as Sostenion. The account of how this church came to be built is curious indeed. The outlining suburb, there, in the outlining suburb, there was a stat statute of a man with wings. Constantine marveled at the work and wondered what it could mean. He asked his nobles, but no one knew to whom it was dedicated. He then besought God, Reveal to me after whom the statue was fashioned. At night, the archangel Michael appeared to him and said, I am the archangel Michael, the helper of the Christians, even as I have assisted thee in thy victories over thine enemies. For this cause, do thou build a church in my name, and I shall preserve thee from all thine enemies until the end of thy life. When the emperor awoke, he immediately set about fulfilling the command of the archangel. The church he erected was huge, for which he apportioned considerable revenues. On the feast day of the archangel, Christians from the suburbs were assembling at the new church from the outlying areas. One of the faithful had a child who was deaf and dumb from his mother's womb. The father brought the lad into the church and besought the archangel to heal him. After much supplicating, the archangel hearkened to the prayer of that poor father. During the divine liturgy, the child was brought before the icon of the chief commander, Michael, when the deacon was about to say, Let us attend, followed by the priest, the holies for the holy, the child in sped spoke up and said, Let us attend. From that hour he was healed. The father returned every year to commemorate and thank the commander of the bodiless host. The deliverance of Constantinople from the perils of the Avars, Persians, and Arabs. The Avars, mounted warriors, came to capture Constantinople. They used their sabers, long lances, and reflex bows that they might gain the advantage. The hierarch at that time gathered the faithful of the city, and they went to the church of the chief commander, Michael. 
where they entreated God to be delivered from captivity to the barbarians. Then, when the Avars were about to enter the city, the archangel Michael, as a flash of lightning, appeared in their midst. Out of their intense fear, many of the Avars fell prostrate to their faces, while others took to their heels and retreated. That same night, the archangel appeared to the Khan of the Avars and said, Leave quickly with all thy host, otherwise tomorrow thou shalt die, and thy soldiers with thee. The Khan, terrified that same night, departed with his entire army and returned to his own place. At another time, the Persian armies assembled and besieged Constantinople. They encamped outside the walls and prevented food and supplies from being brought into the city. The populace was in danger of dying from starvation. Having their hopes only in God, they also brought to mind the previous miracle performed by the archangel Michael. The people went to his church and supplicated him that he might work a miracle as before. Then, on the day that the Persians decided to enter the city, as they laid their ladders against the walls, the archangel Michael appeared to the invaders. Once again, he appeared as lightning, throwing the Persians into a panic. In the commotion created by this visitation, the Persians, in their confusion, began fighting with one another, thinking they were battling the citizens of the city. The Constantinopolitans, beholding the confounded Persians, exited the city, slaying as many as they were able. At another time by sea, a multitude of Arab Muslims attacked the city, the strongest citadel in the world. This occurred during the reign of Emperor Constantine IV, 669-685, grandson of Heraclius. The Arabs had already ravaged the countryside in Asia Minor, dragging off inhabitants to slavery. They heretofore held Cyprus, Rhodes, and Kos. The peninsula of Kizikos was also seized which was in the neighborhood of the capital, thus providing the Muslims with the base for attack. News was then heard that part of the Arab fleet had captured Smyrna and other sections. The Arabs tried again and again to take the city, only more, once more, the faithful flocked to the church of the chief commander, Michael, imploring God and his archangel for help. The archangel hearkened to their cries. He pierced and bore through the Arab ships, causing most of the marauders to die of drowning. After a five-year siege, only three ships out of the entire fleet remained, and they turned and sailed back home in 678. The Preservation of the City of Aculia on the Black Sea, the city of Acolia was under attack by the Saracens. They tarried long with their forces outside the city. Not being able to take the city, the Saracens decided to depart. There was, however, a certain traitor inside the city who informed against the Christians to the Saracen chief, saying, the Christians have a church dedicated to the chief commander, Michael. It lies by the citadel wall. It is there that they supplicate God for his help, and for this reason you cannot launch an attack. The Saracens, receiving this piece of intelligence, set about making war machines to breach the citadel wall. After they had prepared their ropes, rolling battering rams and catapults, they readied one large boulder to thrust against the narrow church. As soon as it was catapulted, the faces of the emir and his officers, who were responsible for flinging that boulder, turned backwards. 
Those wretched men wasted no time loading down the camels with plenty of incense, lamps, and oil. They also took silver from the bridles of their horses and went together to the church of the archangel Michael. They swore among themselves that they would never come again to Acolia for many years and that the city would come to no harm. After they had sworn this vow, their faces returned to their proper places. The Archangel Michael at Colossae and Jermia. The Archangel Michael is remembered also for the miracle he performed at Cronea, the near Colossae in Phrygia. He parched the waters of the river with the infidels released against his holy shrine and St. Archippus. The commemoration of this miracle is on the 6th of September, where a full account is given. The archangel's large basilica in Konai, decorated with mosaics, was a center of pilgrimage and great trade fairs. Now also, in Germia, a city in western Galatia, below Mount Didymon, the archangel Michael wrought numberless cures. In 454, the consul of Constantinople, one Studios, was sick and near death. No physician could offer him a cure or any treatment. At that time, a certain man named Gulio, who was from Germia, came to the capital. He visited the sick consul and began recounting how many miracles were taking place in Germia at the archangel's healing spring. Even the little fish, with the aid of the archangel Michael, were effecting cures. As Studios listened to the accounts, he believed that God would help him. In the company of other ill folk, Studios traveled to Germia. Straightway, as he entered that holy spring, he was cured. Not only Studios received healing, but also his entire traveling party. One of the members was suffering from glaucoma, and he too received a swift cure for his eyes. Studios, beholding the number of miracles taking place, then resolved to spend most of his fortune building a great church to the archangel. The five eyes old basilica of Ashlar masonry, with much sculptured decoration, still survives in Galatia. He endowed the city also with revenues for its maintenance. The consul also built homes for the sick and aged. All the while, sick people kept flocking to the site of the archangel's healing waters. Having come with faith, they were leaving healed, including many blind folk who recovered their sight and the lame who were enabled to walk. The Cure of the Monk, Marcianos, and the Physician At the time of the restoration of the icons during the reigns of Empress Theodora, 842-856, and her son Emperor Michael, there was a certain monk named Marcianos who was living at the monastery of the Archangel Michael inside Constantinople. Whenever Father Marcianos became ill, he did not take refuge in physicians and medicines. His only recourse was to fall before the icon of the Archangel Michael, who always cured him of whatever ailed him. It happened one time that the monk became gravely ill. According to his custom, he hastened to the icon of the Archangel Michael, seeking help. This time, however, the Archangel wished to test him, and did not render a cure. The relatives and friends of Marcianos came and reproved him for not seeking medical treatment, but he would not listen to their counsel. Unbeknownst to Marcianos, they contrived among themselves that they would seek out a physician on his behalf. They found one and learned from him the proper course of treatment and received medicines appropriate to Marcianos' condition. They were to administer them while Marcianos was asleep. 
They therefore took the drugs and hid them in his head cushion and waited until sleep should overtake him. That night, instead of Father Marcianos finding rest, those waiting to administer the drugs fell asleep. Rat Father Marcianos, not being able to sleep, remained wide awake. It then appeared to him that he saw the Archangel Michael exiting the holy sanctuary of the church, being escorted by two beautiful and wondrous youths. He walked over to Father Marcianos as he lay on his pillow. Seeing the drugs, he said to the monk, What are these? The monk answered, I do not know, O Archangel. The chief commander then said to the youths, Take these medicines and put them under the pillow of the physician who concocted them. Marcianos then observed the youths walking out of the church. The archangel then took oil from the oil lamp before his icon. He proceeded to anoint Father Marcianos, who was instantly cured. Father Marcianos, sensible of the healing, kept giving thanks to God. At midnight, the priest went to the church that he might chant the Orthros service. He found Marcianos healthy and restored as before. That same morning, the priest was called to the house of the physician, who had become gravely ill during the night. The priest then recounted all that he had heard from Marcianos. The physician, therefore, came to understand the cause of his sudden illness. He rose up, being supported by others, and went to the church of the archangel Michael. He remained there all day, lying before the icon. By evening, he was cured. But he did not return to his house or profession. He decided to remain at that church and become a monk, bequeathing all he had to that church. This and many other miracles were wrought by the commander of the bodiless host, Michael. Now let us recount select miracles wrought by both archangels Michael and Gabriel, that we may bring our account to a close. The Archangels Help the Fathers at Dochiaru Monastery. The Dochiaru Monastery is located on the southwest shore of the Athenite Promontory, northwest of Xenophontus. Though the origins of the monastery are somewhat obscure, Yet it was first established by Ephemios Darkerios, the cellarer, in the 10th century. The saint had a nephew, the patrician Nicholas, whose father had been a military, military commander during the reigns of Emperor Nicephorus II, Phocus, 963-969, and John Simi. Semiskis, 969-976. Since Nicholas's uncle was abbot of an Athenite monastery, he loved to visit the elder and lavish gifts upon the monastery. At length, Nicholas forsook the world and the things of the world and joined the brotherhood headed by his venerable uncle. In the holy tonsure, Nicholas was given the name Neophytos by St. Ephthemios. In time, the saint entrusted the holy Neophytos as one superior in virtue with the governance and concerns of the monastery. The holy Neophytos renovated, expanded, and improved the monastery. However, his fortune from the world had not sufficed to cover the expenses of iconography for the new and larger church. Our Savior, nonetheless, hearkened to his prayer for this God-pleasing endeavor in the following marvelous manner. During the reign of the Emperor Nicephorus III, Botanietus, 1078-1081. The Chalcadike Peninsula of Longos is approximately 60 miles opposite the Holy Mountain. This is where Dokieru Monastery had its Metokion, that is, a monastery holding. 
Near the monastery's holding, there was atop an ancient pillar the following inscription, Whoever will strike my head will find much gold. Needless to say, many cast stones at the top of the column, but no treasure was to be had. Yet the riddle meant the top of the shadow that was cast by the pillar, that is, where the treasure was hidden. However, God, in his economy, de desired to unravel this mystery at the proper time. At the Metokion, there was a lad of about 20 years of age named Basil, who was paid a wage as a laborer. He, too, with many others, visited the column and wondered at its promise of gold. One day, as the sun was descending, the youth went to the column. He noted where the pillar cast its shadow and began to dig at that spot. Thereupon, he came upon a marble slab. Below the slab, he uncovered a copper vessel filled with gold coins. Upon beholding this enormous find, the youth was completely overcome, but he quickly covered up the spot and hastened to Abbot Neophytus. Approaching the abbot, he declared, Holy Master, a tremendous amount of gold is buried at our Metokion. Send me back with some of the monks that we might transport it here to the monastery. St. Neophytos then dispatched three monks who were seemingly pious with the monastery boat. Thereupon they went to the spawn and took spot and took up the gold, its vessel, and the slab which concealed it. They proceeded to the shore and departed. However, the monks were ill-intentioned. They were enticed by the treasure and plotted to keep it themselves. Therefore, they took up the slab and bound that honest young man to it from his neck. Then, alas, they cast him into the depths of the sea. Evening was drawing nigh. Upon being cast overboard, the lad invoked the aid of the holy archangels. Straightway, the bodiless commanders of the host, archangels Michael and Gabriel, appeared before him, and as eagles with golden wings, they caught him and took him up from the depths of the sea. Then, in a moment, the young man found himself inside the monastery church at Dokiriu, terror-stricken, Basil lay motionless in the church. In the meantime, the three wayward monks divided the treasure among themselves. They hid their portions outside the monastery and then bided their time by the dock till morning. When the hour for Orthros approached, the caretaker of the lights and candles went about his obedience so they might commence chanting the service. He found the youth in the church, but he thought he beheld a phantom. He therefore began to draw back, but then he changed his mind and decided to approach to take a better look at this spectacle. Not quite sure what he was gazing upon, he took to his heels and sought the abbot. Going up to St. Neophytus, he cried aloud, My elder, there is a phantom in the church and I cannot go inside. The abbot answered, What dost thou fear? Make thy cross and proceed courageously. Meanwhile, the other brethren had assembled for the service. They too beheld the youth and hastened to Father Neophytus. The abbot then got up and went into the church with the ecclesiarch. As they entered the church, they clearly espied the youth. He was bound and asleep upon the marble slab that was tied to his neck. The abbot then tapped him with his staff to rouse him. The youth awoke and said, Tell me, O brothers, where am I? I thought I was in the sea where the monks had cast me overboard. Abbot Neophytos then questioned him, saying, Dost thou not know where thou art? Behold the monastery, behold the church of Dokiriu. Behold, I am Abbot Neophytos. Yet tell us, how camest thou here? The youth replied, Leave me at space to come to myself. 
After a short time, Beza related to the brethren all that he had suffered at the hands of the three monks. Abbot Neophytos then said, Tarry here till the morning light. We will chant the service until the three criminals come up from the dock to the monastery. Let them behold the miracle. Morning came, and the abbot ordered that the three monks ascend from the dock. As they stood before him, he addressed them, saying, How goes your discovery, O fathers? Then, in unison, they replied, O elder of ours, the inscription played us false. The lad fooled us, and then, when we threatened him, he fled. Abbot Neophytos then uttered, Glory be to thee, O God, let us go into the church and thank God. Upon entering the church, when those three malefactors caught sight of the youth bound with the marble slab about his neck, from their astonishment they stood speechless. The abbot then threatened them. Thereupon the three men brought the treasure into the monastery. Straightway abbot Neophytos expelled them from the brotherhood. The youth, Basil, who desired to become a monk, was then tonsured and renamed Barnabas. At length he succeeded the elder Neophytos as abbot. Thus the church was decorated with sacred icons and named in honor of the holy archangels Michael and Gabriel. The Finding of Water at Dokieru Dokieru Monastery also has a holy fountain named after the archangels Michael and Gabriel. A miracle brought into existence this well. In the 14th century, during the reign of Emperor Andronicus Paleogos, the monks of the monastery were compelled to fetch water from a distance of three miles. This caused many hardships and even sickness for the brethren. Monk Theodulus, a builder at the monastery, planned to lay large underground pipes to convey water. Then, on the eve before the work would commence, the two archangels, Michael and Gabriel, appeared to Theodulus and said, O oh man, why dost thou labor and exhaust the monastery in, in vain? Know this, water is inside the monastery. As Theodorus listened, it seemed to him that he rose up and said to them, I beseech you, show me where it is. Thereupon they answered, Come, and we will show thee. Then the two archangels took him by the hands and brought him to a spot where today a well is located. Arriving at the indicated site, they took up digging tools and began to work. Not much time passed before the archangels offered water to the monk. Theodulus partook and found the water very sweet. Straightway, he awakened from sleep and called the brethren, saying, In my sleep this night I beheld a vision, wherein the two archangels came and showed me where water is located on the monastery grounds. Therefore, let us dig in that place where they showed me. The brethren rallied and began digging. Forthwith, a vein of water sprung forth. The monks dug deeper, and drinkable water gushed forth. They glorified God and his archangels. The well exists to this day. The water is well reputed to be sanctified, and those who drink with faith find healing from every sickness. These miracles, brethren, which we have recounted, are but a few of the countless wonders performed by the archangels. We have recounted these few, which sufficiently glorify God and his archangels. O angelic hosts, who stand before the throne of God and ever hold chorus, O archangels and angels, principalities, thrones and dominions, six-winged seraphim and divine and many-eyed cherubim, Vessels of wisdom, authorities, and powers most divine, pray to Christ that he grant our souls peace, great mercy, and his kingdom. Through the intercessions of thine archangels and all of the celestial host, O Christ God, have mercy on us. Amen.